Hey, it's John Reed live again, and I'm on an unusual schedule. I'm on Thursday, but I had to switch to Thursday to get this special guest who I've been dreaming about getting since I started the show. So, Laura Ciceri, welcome aboard. Thank you, John. We're going to talk with Laura about supply chain disruptions, upheavals, everything we faced during the pandemic. Is there hope for supply chain modernization? Laura's got her countdown of most hated supply chain buzzwords. I can't wait to go through that. So this is going to be an action-packed uh, broadcast. As always, your your comments and questions will, will drive everything. So uh, I think it'll be great. Um, now, uh, I did want to say that Laura's a perfect guest here because this is basically a loosely inspired uh, show for my weekly hits and misses column. And I would say Laura's one of the most prominently featured uh uh, bloggers in that column over the years. And there's a reason why uh, it's not just the fact that she's an expert in supply chain, but she brings a really unique point of view uh, in her blogs that I think is memorable and important. And, uh, and we're going to go into a few of her blogs today to give you a little better idea what I'm talking about uh, with that. She's actually won one of my awards. I think, I think you're a blogger of the year, a year or two ago. So, no. uh, but anyhow, um, on, on where we go. But I wanted to start with, with, before we get into sort of the market, I wanted to get into a little bit about, uh, oh, hi, hi to the regulars. Hi, Thomas. Hi, LinkedIn user. Thanks for making a schedule change here. I, th I think you'll be amply rewarded. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit, Laura, about the impact of the pandemic on how you assess the market, because you know I know that a, a lot of us thrived on being in front of customers face-to-face, -face, going to shows. So you know, how have you adapted to kind of keep keep an edge up in your your research and your point of view despite all of this? Well, thank you, John. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, COVID nineteen has been fascinating. I actually had COVID nineteen in March, back when it was not very well understood, and I grounded myself and uh, really started thinking about my business. And uh, it's been a good time to stop and reflect and to do more podcasts and more writing and help supply chain leaders not just think about the supply chains they have, but how do they build better? Because during the pandemic, the supply chain systems didn't do very well. Most people had to turn the demand planning systems off and their supply systems were not up to the task either. So I have a lot of inquiry right now and uh, dialogues with supply chain leaders about how do they build better. And unlike a lot of independent analysts and bloggers, most of my revenue comes from line of business leaders, not from technology firms. So, you know, supply chain's hot, you know? So I may not be a hot gal, but supply chain's hot. Well, you're, you're smoking hot for the purposes of our show, which is why <laughs> you're here. Uh, Thomas says he, she's really glad that you're back, back up again. And Thanks. Um, I, Personally, I thought it was really cool that you actually blogged about that experience and tied it into your work. Um, that was a time where uh, we didn't have a whole lot of people speaking openly about it, which uh, which I thought was really good. But that's one of the hallmarks of your blog, right? I mean, um, you, you kind of put it all out there. Yeah, blogging should be about life, right? It's, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a lot about life. And, you know, I think a lot of times people don't share – their life failures, right? And I think when you're naked in your blogs, you know, it resonates and people have more willingness to read it. You know, nobody wants to read about perfection or, you know, you know, theoretical. Oh, absolutely. So, so blogging is a part of your um, part of your discipline, but what else? Tell us, you do a ton of stuff for an independent, you put on your own show, you, how do you balance everything? Research, client engagements, is, is that all part of your, your practice? Yeah, so uh, I'm very fortunate. I'm followed by 320,000 people on LinkedIn. I really focused on building a LinkedIn following so that I could have a panel group to do independent research. And my philosophy is people give to me, I give back to them, and I don't put research behind a paywall. I give it freely. And I write for Forbes, I write for LinkedIn as a LinkedIn influencer, and I have my blog. And that drives a line of business leaders asking me questions about technologies, about process, about what's possible. And I answer every question. And the way I do it is I have a great assistant and you know I work pretty hard. And um, 
you know, I spend a lot of time on the phone. Uh, Thomas has a question for you. He's not a supply chain expert, but is the, is the assumption right that they use the wrong optimization model for the supply chain cheap instead of resilient? Well, most companies have multiple supply chains. Uh, you know, optimization functions should be based upon supply chain design. So I often say that people have an efficient supply chain, which is lowest cost per unit, which is very focused on predictable demand. And they also probably have a responsive supply chain, which is how can I deal with high variability with very short cycles, which is what you often need in e-commerce. And people often have an agile supply chain too, which is very high demand and supply variability. And I find most people, you know, in the press these days will generalize supply chain discussions, which are tough, right? Because, you know, supply chain should really be based upon the analysis of rhythms and cycles. And it's a lot about math. Yeah. And, and Laura, we're going to get into some hated buzzwords in a bit, but Right off the bat, shouldn't vendors be banned for using the phrase predictive supply chain for at least a year, given how poorly the predictive aspect of this performs so far? Shouldn't shouldn't there be a moratorium on that for a little while? I don't know. I, I think as we build better, we have the opportunity to be predictive, be prescriptive, and to even be cognitive. But I think there's some lessons learned that we need to go in that model because when we model data with a lot of latency, it doesn't help us. And so traditional supply chains have modeled orders and shipments, which have a lot of latency in the signal. And we've mined order and shipment patterns, which doesn't help us a lot. So we need to change our thinking to be outside in and really look at market data, whether it's point of sale data or e-commerce data or consumption data to decrease our latency to get those signals. And just to give you an example, when I used to work at Clorox, when we shipped blue label bleach before all the colors and flavors, the demand latency from a Walmart to Clorox where I had very high moving good was two weeks. But when we added, you know, all the colors, you know, the demand latency became six weeks. So the orders will be out of step with the market by weeks. Something like sinus medicine can be 180 days out of step with the market. So what we've put in place are predictive models on old data. And I think we've got to look at the stale data as the problem more than the fact that we were trying to be predictive. Fair enough. So in, in I want to walk through a couple of your blog posts and and get a handle on this. So you wrote a really good one in September about the what you call dealing with the supply chain gloppy mess. And there were a couple of really key points, I think. Um, you talked about the traditional processes aren't equal to the wild swings of the market. Pre-pandemic, only 30% of supply chain leaders were satisfied with their supply chains. During the pandemic, business leader satisfaction is falling precipitously and most are struggling to find consultants to help. And then you walk through a bunch of like disparate examples through industries of volatility of various kinds. And you continue along a little bit and say, over the course of three decades, companies invested in enterprise systems to improve functional efficiency. Today, the pandemic is highlighting the folly. Efficient functional systems tethered to ERP are inflexible and self-serving. The conventional supply chain processes are unable to sense and respond as market shift. So tell us more about that. I think that's a crucial point. <laughs> well, that's a big quote. I, you know, so I probably had a big cup of tea when I was writing that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that we've gone through decades of kind of, you know, what are supply chain systems, right? So in the 1990s, I built regional supply chain systems, which were very focused around optimization and kind of the dawn of best of breed. And the 2000 period out of Y2K, which a lot of people don't remember Y2K, we became very infatuated with decision support, which supply chain planning is a part of decision support, needed to be tightly integrated with ERP, which just really took us backwards in so many ways. First of all, only 40% of the data in planning comes from ERP. And people basically stopped 
a lot of the expertise around planning as they became very infatuated with ordered cash and procure to pay. And so a lot of the basics around demand planning, inventory management, tactical supply planning were sort of cast to the wind. And we became very focused on bolding in supply chain technologies without really asking the question of how should I make a decision and what is a good decision? And we came up with all this jargon like end-to-end integrated systems. And we didn't really step back and rationalize what is an end, what is an end, and what is integration. Most business leaders want the ability to see data across their teams, whereas technologists say that needs to be a cool API and a good batch job. So we're at a real disconnect there. And the movement to tightly integrated ERP took us back about two decades. Yeah, and you also made an important point too, right, that that I think that's become more and more problematic because you talk about how in today's IT architectures, there's no place to put market signals, internet of things, logistics, weather data, consumption data, traffic patterns. You say we have tethered the supply chain of transactional enterprise data, which seems deeply problematic, especially given the circumstances we're faced with now. Yeah, it's really problematic because the enterprise is insular, but we've made it even more insular. And even worse, instead of tethering the supply chain to the market or consumption patterns, we have tethered it to the budget. And so we get kind of this dead sea of management by objectives. And so we're gaming the system upstream from sales and operations planning, IBP, and we're beating the folks downstream. So gaming for more trade promotions, more deals, more money for sales, and beating the folks downstream in the back office about how they can do more for less. But the issue is that most people, 85% or more, don't have a feasible plan, and they don't have the flexibility to do what-if analysis to look at the impact of these changes on the plan. So we can't see mix as items change. We treat all items the same. We can't see volume and we can't see price impacts. So we can't have good discussions about how we make decisions. The good news is I think out of the pandemic, people are waking up going, what I have today just doesn't work, right? And what I've bought is really legacy. So how do I start all over again? And how do I build outside in processes? And how do I help people with a what if analysis to help them do their jobs and make better decisions? So the confidence is is shaken then, which can be a good thing, I guess. Yes, right. Yeah. Uh, Thomas raises this point you were referring to around predictive. How can a model predict a situation if it hasn't been and couldn't have been trained for lacking the data? So I guess that is the problem of unique historical circumstances as well, huh? Well, you know, you can see patterns in models, right? You may not have seen that particular event in history, but you might have seen patterns in terms of demand consumption. And really what the models need to do is mine the patterns. Where we've gotten lost is trying to be too precise on imprecise data and not really look at the patterns, right? The supply chain is all about dancing with you know, variation and grayness uh, and setting up buffers and looking at, you know, alternate supply and coming up with what if analysis. And so you got to be able to dance in the world of the gray if you're going to be a supply chain leader. Greg was struck by your comment around 85% don't have a, a feasibility plan. That's, that's kind of shocking number. Yeah. Feasible plan. Right. And so, What's happened is we've gotten a longer tail in the supply chain. We've increased demand error. And most people, you know, still use Excel spreadsheets as their planning tool. And they treat a unit as a unit and the stock keeping unit as a, you know, equally with another one. And they don't look at the variability. And so they don't look at the impact on assets. So what's happening is we're trying to sweat our assets more and more. And we're trying to build a feasible plan, which is sending our factories into circular doom loops. So with COVID, we're trying to 
pull that up and trying to get much more disciplined about how we run factories, fewer scheduling changes. And people are starting to really look at cycle stock and production scheduling and how we do this differently. Another blog post that I think I want to add to the mix here was in October, Say Customer Service and Mean It, where you kind of put the critique to the notion of customer-driven supply chains and what some of the misconceptions around customer-centric supply chains are because you talked about how people are coming up to you in presentations and saying, you know, we need to serve our customers better and and then asking what that actually means. Uh, how, how do you get to the specifics of that? So what what does that all mean to you? Why is this debate important? Well, often people will say, well, I want to be customer centric. And then they'll say, well, that means doing whatever my customer asks. And that's not customer centric. You know, customer centric is being able to know your customer and anticipate their needs and to be able to work proactively with your customer. So anybody who asks me about their customer, you know, doesn't know their customer. And so the first goal is to know the customer and to know who the roles are at the customer in terms of what drives the buying and what's important to them. And, you know, you can't substitute, you know, transactions for relationships and supply chain is all about relationships and making things work in the face of uncertainty. Yeah. And then uh, I'll post a link to your blog a little later in the show, but um, one of my favorite enterprise blog posts probably ever um, Mourning the death of the data-driven supply chain guy. Your tribute to your to your friend Joe, who was a supply chain planner. Uh, just a beautiful piece mm -hmm. of writing, but but Thank also some, but also some really really important um, insights that came out mm -hmm. of of you uh, being close with Joe uh, in the in the last time of his life, and and how he was comparing some of his medical mm -hmm. diagnosis to how supply chains work, which I thought was really fascinating, and I think it pointed to a lot of the points you're making here around things like deriving insights from images, uh, diverse teams, um, clear outcomes, data wrangling. These all seemed really, really important as far as what's missing, right, in a lot of today's supply chain projects. Yeah. Um, Joe was a facilitator of his own care, right? He had uh, a diverse group of people that helped him through really two years of tough cancer treatments. And I don't know if your listeners have ever read the book, Tuesdays with Maury. Uh, my life in the last two years has been Friday with Joe. And so when Joe was diagnosed with kidney cancer, you know, I said, oh, Joe, how can I help you? And he's like, I don't want to talk about cancer. Call me up every week and let's just talk supply chain. So right. I did that every Friday. And we talked about a lot of stuff, but I, he got a lot of um, solace out of managing his journey to death. And, you know, he loved the data-driven science behind biologics and mapping the size of his tumors and talking to people that were different about, you know, his care. And he would laugh. He had an old guy on his team and he had a young guy on his team and they didn't get along. And, he really used the data to bring them together to really talk about treatment and outcomes. And he, he would always laugh and he said, I never knew my skills in supply chain would be so valuable. Right. And he said, and I learned an awful lot about imaging and how collaborative technologies could help to bridge people together when they could be very grounded in the data and very grounded in the science. And so I wrote another piece right after that about let's give science a chance, which is about, you know, instead of making supply chains so political, you know, let's bring more science into the supply chains. And so, yeah, <clears throat> that was a tough blog post to write though. I'm sure it was. And uh, one of our audiences says, bless you. I, I know the feeling folks. And that's why I wanted her on the show because mm -hmm. I, that's that's real. That's the life we're living now, and we can't really back away from it. But but it's also beautiful to think about deriving inspiration and insight from what we're going through as well. Um, and and at the end of the show, I'll put the link in, and you can go have a read the blog. I just don't want you to read it right now since we're talking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Greg, Greg says um, he's the quote he's stealing is you cannot substitute transactions for relationships. I think that's a pretty good uh, point given what we just talked through. 
Right. So I want to ask you uh, now to start going through a few of, of, of the things you don't like here around these buzzwords. Cause I think the buzzwords explaining what bothers you about them should give us some insight. Um, when I told you I wanted to do a snarky countdown of what bothers you, uh, you said first, you said the competition between gold diggers focused on making money and egocentric leaders trying to drive name recognition versus driving real value. So that's a big kabloom to the market there. Yeah. So the supply chain is really in this tussle of, you know, the people that are selling supply chain software make a lot of money. Uh, you know, if you ever want to get insight, ask the salesman who's, you know, selling your software, what he reported to his government. And it'll be eye-opening, right? Because these are large checks, large commissions that people are getting. And it does not attract Sunday school teachers. Uh, and part of the art of the deal is causing disruption within teams to basically play to egos, right? So you're a smart guy, and because you're a smart guy, you're gonna wanna buy my stuff. And you know, as the deal goes on, you know, the smart salesperson tries to play to the personalities on the team, which will often cause the team to have real issues and refs. And a lot of times people will call me and they'll say, you know, I've been looking at supply chain software for you know 24 months and I can't make a decision. And it's because there is an intentional drive by the supply chain salesman to cause disruption and to basically, you know, sell and uh, they get into this real issue of how do I make a decision? So on the other side, we have a lot of egos around supply chain leadership on, you know, kind of empire building or, you know, legacy building. And, you know, they want to be on stages and they want to talk, but we're really not holding ourselves accountable to balance sheets. And unfortunately, you know, we've got a lot of groups and for some reason they're in England and these are pay for play event companies. And so they really take their wagons to big software companies who pay them to put on events and the ego motivated supply chain leaders who want to tell their stories, but those stories aren't always grounded in results. So as a result, we sort of get a merry-go-round of people making a lot of money, building up a lot of egos, telling the stories, but we don't ground it with, does this stuff really work? And at the end of the day, is there more value in this approach? Well put. Okay. So give us your number five on supply chain buzzwords that you think are problematic. Give us one of them. <coughs> digital twin. Oh boy. The digital twin. Ouch. And the reason I think it's very compelling conceptually, but overused, overbuzzed, lacking definition. So I believe the digital twin is a sandbox that allows everyone in the back office to do modeling. And uh, many people use it in a much more limited way, but it's everywhere, right? So your issue is more that the hype exceeds the practical reality at the moment. Yeah, just that it's buzzy without definitions, right? You know, I think that advancement requires big wings that we teach people the promise, but we ground it in very solid definitions. And, uh, you know, everybody's got a digital twin and, you know, the digital twins do everything, including baking bread for your dinner. And, you know, they're not grounded in reality. Mm, yeah. I, if the digital twin could bake for me tonight, I would definitely, my perception of digital twins would go through the roof. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, give us another one. Control tower. Oh, no. What's wrong with the control tower? That gives me that feeling of overseeing all my operations, visibility. It sounds great. Sure. What are you controlling? You know, um, most of the time people put in technology and they want visibility, but they don't know how to define visibility. And I'm a chemical engineer, so I spent many years in control theory. And what is it you're controlling and why? And people can answer that question. So everybody's walking around, you know, thinking that they need 
like an airplane cockpit, you know, control tower. But that airplane cockpit control tower is designed to control planes landing safely. It wasn't designed to just see planes in the sky. It was to land the plane safely. So what is the goal of the control tower and how do you get from visibility to action? And people can answer that question and everybody in the space technologists have a control tower. They all look differently. And most of the time they don't land the plane. Uh, Josh Greenbaum chimes in. A digital twin is a great buzzword that allows vendors to pretend they're more innovative than they are. Ouch. Sounds like Josh needs a break from some of his uh, analyst briefings today. That's that's kind of rough ter terrain there. Okay, give us another one, hi, Laura. Oh, oh, by the way, Laura says hi, Josh. Uh, the integrated end-to-end -end supply chain. Oh, man, what's wrong with end-to-end -end supply chains? It sounds really cohesive. Well, the problem is what is an end and what is an end? And mm. why is it integrated versus synchronized and harmonized? And what are you trying to drive, right? So a lot of times people will say to me that they want to have an integrated end-to-end -end supply chain that's agile, responsive, and efficient. And I'm like, you don't know supply chain, you know, because you really have to be conscious of choice around the response, whether it's efficient, responsive, or agile. And the supply chains need to be designed. And we've got to be conscious about what is an end, what is an end. And integration just takes us down a wastebasket, right? We really need to be focused on synchronization and harmonization and managing flows. Mm. Josh says this is his break between briefings. Josh, well, I'm glad you perceive this as a break. That I'll take that as a as a high compliment. Well, yeah, I'm sorry to bore you on your break, Josh. You know, but uh... well, we'll we'll try to keep things keep things edgy for for Josh. All right, you got two more. Give us another one of your unlikable mm. buzzwords. Of my unlikable buzzwords. <laughs> what do you think of the three I gave you so far? Uh, they're excellent. I mean, those you, you, you just ruined a whole lot of PowerPoints. It's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Well, you know, the other buzzword that, you know, drives me nuts is seamless, right? So all technology companies have what I call the layer cake slides, right? So you've got the slide where you've got the technology company that's at the center of the world, and then you've got, you know, the logo slide where everybody does everything for everybody. And both of those slides are really meaningless. And they say that they provide seamless results, right? So when I ask what is the result that's seamless, they can't answer the question, right? And so what I find is we get caught up in a lot of gobbledygook about what is it we really do. And I find a lot of what I call pink ghetto marketing, which is, you know, a lot of hollow words um, that is out there, which has a lot of these smooth words that don't lead us anywhere. No worries, Josh. I won't put that out there. I, I saw what you did there. I'm going to leave that one alone. Um, and also on your list, Laura, you had a, one of the terms we see a lot, which is IBP. What, what bothers you about IBP? Well, I will put that at the top of our list. Um, All right. That's number one with a bullet, huh? Yeah. So integrated business planning sounds great. It sounds like a Band-Aid, right? I'm going to pull all these functions together and we're going to come up with a common plan and we're going to march together and we're going to work together and we're going to solve whatever the world problem is. The problem is that we confuse management by objectives and management processes with the need for the supply chain to have sunlight with outside in processes. So what's happening as we get very much into IBP, we get into closely tethering the supply chain to the budget, which is out of sync, gaming the system because you can't have more bias and error than asking sales what they're gonna sell. And this Ferris will that really gives us a lot of meetings to go to but muddies the water in terms of what's important in the supply chain and distorts the signal. 
Uh, we have a comment. You are literally ruining the slides I've been working on and made me rethink the whole concept of what I'm trying to communicate with senior management. So that's a high, that's high praise indeed. No, uh, good. You, you don't want to go to senior management with larded up with those buzzwords. Trust me. Um, it might work temporarily, but project results are actually what's going to advance the career path out there in the real world. So, um, and then you have one more on your list. You don't, you're not a fan of digital supply chains. Tell us why you don't like that phrase. Well, a lot of times people will say they want to have a digital supply chain and I'll say, what does that mean? And they'll talk about that. They want it to be faster and hands-free, but the problem is 96% of companies are stuck at the intersection of inventory turns, operating margin and growth. And how, why should we make those processes faster? That's just going to send us over the cliff. I define digital supply chains as rethinking the atoms and electrons of the supply chain to improve value. So questions like, should I be manufacturing a product or 3D printing it or selling services? And what are the outcomes? And how do I drive the outcomes so that we can really drive value for people, whether it's the circular economy or rethinking, you know, what the role of people or things in the supply chain are. The digital world, I think, allows us to step back and say, how do we do it better? You know? Absolutely. Well, I think we've gutted a lot of misconceptions and problematized a lot of concepts, but I want to turn our attention now a little bit to what constitutes success and progress on supply chain projects. And one way I wanted to do this is by talking about your your supply chains to admire awards um, and one of the winners of that. But tell us a little bit about why you decided to, to, to create awards and what are some of your criteria? What are you looking for? So I used to work for Gartner and then I worked for AMR Research and Gartner didn't care as much about supply chains as I did, which is why I left Gartner. And AMR cared about supply chains, but was bought by Gartner. And uh, when I was at AMR Research, we had a technique that we called the top 25. And it was the AMR top 25 that then became the Gartner top 25. And it was highly driven by consensus of supply chain leaders, almost a popularity contest. You know, 50% of the determination of what was a good supply chain was based upon people voting. And that sounds good, but remember, we've got that flywheel effect of gold diggers and egos. And so you've got a lot of big egos out there that are telling their stories that aren't grounded in reality. And when I was an analyst and I was asked to vote on supply chains, I didn't know enough, right? I mean, I primarily covered process industries and, you know, what's the difference between Airbus and Boeing and Sikorsky? I didn't know, right? So I started a data-driven initiative where I started plotting orbit charts at the intersection of metrics for supply chain. And I did a project with the University of Arizona on statistical mapping of what should a balance scorecard in supply chain be? In other words, what group of balance sheet metrics of people were really good at would drive improved market valuation? And we determined it was growth. Growth correlates very highly to market cap. Operating margin could be gross margin or EVA, but you know those three, so I picked operating margin. Inventory turns, not cash to cash, because cash to cash is a compound metric and we've elongated payables, but have not improved inventory. In fact, we've added 20 days of inventory across all industries in the last decade. And return on invested capital, which is looking at how effectively am I using the capital? Now, many times people have a much more simplistic view of supply chains that it's a triangle that balances cash, service, and um, inventory, but that's too simplistic, right? And we don't have a good metric or benchmark for service. So while I value service in the complex nonlinear world, it's not on a balance sheet. So I started plotting orbit charts, which are really looking at the intersections of these metrics to look at which companies were driving improvement against the peer group. 
And determining the peer group was a whole activity that took me about two years to do. And then I worked with the University of Arizona to look at the combination of those metrics and how it changes over time. And I've done it for a decade now, and this is actually the subject of my next book, because what I see in peer groups are patterns where the leaders continue to do well year over year. So the progress at Ecolab that Alex drove, the progress at Snyder Electric that Annette and Murad have driven, but the perceived leaders like Procter and Gamble have not done well. And the perceived leaders, you know, have kind of this false kind of stature in the market that kind of insulates us to look at value. And so I publish that every year, and then I write the case studies of the supply chains to admire in the blog. And my new book is the case studies of the supply chains to admire and about the methodology and what I've learned by correlating the quantitative research to that balance sheet discovery and what drives superlative supply chains. Yeah, you have a comment. Uh, we have an audience member who is inspired by your commentary. So I hope you turn that inspiration into productive work in your project. That's well, thank cool. you. But nice job, Laura. Um, so I wanted to ask you in in your Say Customer Service and Mean It blog, you talk about one of your award winners, uh, the sleep number that has won for two consecutive years. Can you tell us a little bit more about why this particular company excels in your view? I love the sleep number story. So the first thing that they do when they come to the stage is they ask you, what was your sleep number last night? Which is really a way of communicating, how well did you sleep? And they don't believe they sell beds. They believe that they sell wellness and sleep. And they've got the largest database on sleeping ever. And all of their beds communicate to their database. And they're continually communicating to their customers about how they can use their product to sleep better. And sleep is really important to wellness, really important to everything as we age, right? Now they own their supply chain all the way to the end. So, you know, white glove delivery to an apartment in New York or, you know, a farmhouse in Iowa, they design their supply chain for late stage postponement and they own the supply chain all the way to the end. So why is it a supply chain to admire? They have evolved the model focused on service and outcomes as they've grown successfully with the focus on the customer. They are outperforming the furniture industry on all of those four metrics. And I love what they're doing on innovation and analytics. They are not held to doing a project just because it has an ROI. Their management team believes it is core to their DNA to use analytics and new methods and supply chain to out deliver against the brand opportunity. So it's a great case study in leadership. I muted out for a sec for my cough drop. Um, Josh says who needs Ted talks you can get Laura to talk about supply chain excellence. Indeed. Who, who no, thank needs? you. Yeah, much, much better. All right. So, so now just to shift gears, you've kind of held out like, what what an award winner looks like. What happens if a customer contacts you and says, I want to optimize my supply chain? Like, where do I begin? Like, what? how would that conversation go? Well, I start by saying, what is it you're trying to do? What is the outcome that you're trying to really deliver? So in the case of sleep number, it is better sleep. In the case of L'Oreal, it is trying to provide differentiation and making beauty. And so what is it you're trying to do? And then let's map the river of demand outside in. Let's look at market signals. Let's look at all of the stakeholders on the river demand, what they need, how they need to work, and how can we map supply chain processes to not focus on numbers, but to focus on patterns and to really help people in your organization to navigate the river of demand. And how forecastable is your data? You know, what are your issues around supply reliability? How do you improve reliability? How do you stay focused on the metrics that matter, which are the four, and then take the functions into a focus on reliability, whether it's forecast value add or schedule adherence or first pass yield or 
shipping orders correctly. We've got to get out of functional metrics like manufacturing cost or transportation cost and focus on total cost. We got to get out of functional metrics like OEE and purchase price variance and focus on reliability of schedule adherence, first pass yield, customer fulfillment, and how do you change that mindset? So, so I work with customers on that change management journey. Only at the end do we talk about technology. Mm. And is it the case where you eventually hone in on a particular area that, that, that is mutually agreed upon as far as a weak area or a place where you can get a, a quicker result and build momentum or like how, how does the project begin once you actually get into that phase? Well, you know, I work with the team, facilitate the team to build their own roadmap based upon mm -hmm. what they think is important for their outcomes. Right. Mm -hmm. So back to the sleep number, they're really very interested in, learning about sleep and tying it to the design of the bed and tying it to the implementation of the bed. Great. Let's go do it. Let's talk about cognitive analytics and rules-based ontologies and how we do that. Right. And the, you know, so you start with what are the outcomes, but so many times we don't start there. We don't start with what is it we're trying to deliver to a buyer or a user of our solutions in terms of outcomes and how do we really improve the supply chain delivery? What most people start with is I want to bolt in technology and here are my screwdrivers and here are my big consultants and, you know, here's my big PowerPoint deck. And they get misguided along the way. A uh, comment by LinkedIn user. It's all really complicated. Multiple businesses within a company all find their own path due to lack of IT guidance. You got a comment on that, Laura? Yeah, I don't think it's IT guidance. I think it's business leadership. Yeah. Every company culturally makes decisions slightly differently. So a company like J&J &J will always make their decisions locally and regionally. So Unilever the same way. That's their culture, right? And a company like P&G is more of a matrix organization. That's their culture. And a company like Dell is more corporately driven. That's their culture. So the question I ask people is what is a good decision and how do you build decision frameworks with technology to help people make better decisions? And how do you know that that is a good decision and how do you build learning organizations on top of that? I think IT's role is to facilitate that journey. I do not think it's IT's role to drive that journey. Mm. Yeah, you just mentioned something that I I picked up on in one of your posts as well that I thought was really interesting because so many uh, next gen supply chain tools talk about planning, 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 whereas you're really pushing more on de on decision frameworks. Can you explain what you see as the difference there? Well, planning is a type of decision support. You know, traditional supply chain planning, as is revenue management, as is trade promotion management, as is you know, sourcing strategies. And so I think we have to look at all forms of decision support and we've got to ask ourselves, what is a good decision? How should people make decisions? You know, should it be local? Should it be regional? Should it be global? Who is the decision tiebreaker, which I believe is the P&L leader? How do we orchestrate so that they get the right information? It's a feasible plan. We're looking at what if analysis. And then how do we drive after action review for learning? And those decision frameworks are very important to be sure that we use the technologies. Mm. Yeah. And I'd ask you to, to have, have a few uh, pointers on lessons from successful supply chain projects. And, and number one on your list was leadership with a bullet, which you already covered just now. Um, are there any other things that kind of stand out as far as, some, some key characteristics you're seeing on supply chain products that are successful in your view? Six, successful supply chain projects or products? Uh, can you clarify? Um, projects, like when, when you embark upon a supply chain project, what are some of the, the keys you observe to success? Are there any that we haven't mentioned yet? Well, I think that, you know, supply chain projects often depend upon enlisting global teams and, uh, Global teams, by definition, require a leader that is good in managing diversity. 
And I, my observation is that the leaders that do this best have a great sense of humor. They laugh a lot at themselves and they build up the team around them and they make it fun to work on it and they celebrate success and they make sure that the team is grounded in what matters. What I find often in supply chain projects, because they go to the veins of the company, right? If you screw up a supply chain project, it's ugly, right? And I remember my first supply chain project, I shorted vanilla ice cream on Thanksgiving day, right? You know, I'll always remember that, you know, because I got called to the carpet for short shipping those orders. So you're working in the veins of the company when you're doing supply chain. And so the leader that can help to drive that forward and make the team look good, even though you're going to stub your toe and build that momentum and embrace diversity is what I see is really needed. Mm. A success supply chain project that is attempted to be led by IT has a high probability of failing. How can we change one hour meetings with PowerPoint slide decks to a more collaborative approach? Well, therein lies the tale, right? It's a culture change you're talking about, really. <laughs> well, I like to have people draw. So one of my favorite activities is I give people a blank sheet of paper and I give them a pen and I, a crayon and I ask them to draw the supply chain today and the supply chain tomorrow. And that helps you to understand their mental models. And 150 people that I've taught supply chain management to, only one person picked up the crayon and drew the customer first. Most people pick up the crayon and they draw the manufacturing plant or they draw mm -hmm. the supplier first. And so that's a teaching moment, that's an experiential learning moment. So one of the things that I love to do now is virtual facilitation on Miro or Mural to help them with drawing and thinking about supply chain more holistically and to really get at the issues behind these words of what is integration and what is end to end and what is a control tower really? And I love the technique of drawing and mm. active collaboration. Mm. Very cool. One thing I wanted to ask you about is obviously we, we, we saw a lot of weak links in supply chain management exposed in the last year. One of the knee jerk lessons that is being seized upon is the need for perceived need for regionalization and localization and perhaps redundancy of supply chains. I don't see hardly any supply chain planners saying, I want to go back to having a lot of inventory again, but I see a number of them discussing, should we diversify our supply chain networks? So we're not screwed when such and such region goes down for whatever reason, what is your perception of, of that discussion? Well, we hit the pandemic with 20 days more inventory across industries than we had in the recession of 2007. And inventories today are pretty high. It's just we have the wrong stuff. Uh, so we've never had warehouses fuller. And one of the reasons why we can't offload the chassis in Long Beach is there's no place to put stuff, right? Because we got the wrong stuff in the warehouses. So what are our lessons to be learned, right? There is a need for a regional supply chain. There's a need for a global supply chain, but we need to think about what drives value, right? We got lost because we chased the model of labor arbitrage when you know, we basically changed trade in 2001 so that we could use cheaper labor in Asia to make labor intensive goods. And a lot of people are still dealing with that mental model. That is not today's mental model. Today's mental model is building supply chains effectively for regions. People will say to me, well, are we gonna take manufacturing out of China? Absolutely not. We need to have growth plans for the Chinese markets and manufacturing plants and distribution centers for the Chinese markets. And oh, by the way, the Chinese are not as advanced in supply chain thinking. There's an opportunity there. You know, are we going to bring manufacturing back to the U.S.? Well, what does that mean, right? What is made in the U.S., right? Average manufacturing input is about 40% of labor of a good sold in the U.S. We need to think about 
the fact that the supply chains are multi-stage going across multiple countries based upon intellectual property and cost. But one of my issues is only 9% of people actively design their supply chains. I was a chemical engineer. I could never have gotten out of school without designing distillation columns and heat exchangers, but only 9% of people actively design their supply chains. We need to design the supply chain for outcomes. We need to constantly redesign to improve outcomes. And we need to embrace the flows of the supply chain and be conscious about the choice of the design of the nodes. That's my answer. So it's not a simple answer, but I hope it's one of going from consciously incompetent to becoming consciously competent. That would help. Josh has a question that gets back to our customer-driven supply chain discussion. What's the role of CRM CX leaders in planning the supply chain? A CRM uh, made sales planning more efficient. It made call centers more efficient. It did not improve our ability for the supply chain to be more effective in delivering goods and services to customers. The models of CRM do not connect to the supply chain. Really what happened in the last decade is we made functional supply chain applications and functional enterprise applications that were self-serving. And we've made them more efficient and we've made those walls between sales, marketing and supply chain worse. And what we've got to do is break the walls. And you know, I actually think of CRM as legacy applications and go to the markets and open up the dams to get the market signals. And maybe you get a little input from sales and marketing along the way, but supply chains need to be able to connect to market signals. Wow, CRM is legacy. That time for people to update their LinkedIn profiles. Sorry, uh, Josh. Ouch. Um, <laughs> You know, it's interesting. Like, I just had a uh, did a use case on uh, the su a supply chain manager over at Burton Snowboards, and she, I asked her about does she use the word transformation to describe what she's going through, and she kind of said not so much, but she said what's going to be driving it more is customer demand, and and that right now the the sales channel transformation is what's the biggest thing for them as far as changing their own, and she said right. They typically have a two-year product development cycle, um, and now they want to get it down to 12 months. And so that's, that kind of shift in customer demand and agility is affecting their supply chain planning. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I'd love to talk to her about attribute-based planning and design of the new product launch supply chain. That's an example of a different supply chain that needs design, and the decision support tools for a new product launch are very different than the turn volume. There's something of a snarky question about, about Amazon. I don't really want to get into too much snark on Amazon, but I am curious what you think about uh, these global supply chains where um, you know companies like Amazon and, and, and Walmart throw disproportionate weight around. Is, is that a good thing or is that a problem? Or They're power brokers, right? I mean, let's give Amazon credit. They redesigned the supply chain for different outcomes, right? I never thought I would be buying what I buy today from Amazon. You know, let's celebrate the innovation and let's embrace the next innovation, right? Uh, we have started to redesign the last mile delivery. We are focused on the middle mile. We have many different forms of convenience shopping uh, today and they'll continue to grow exponentially. So I want to celebrate all the companies that have driven innovation and supply chain, supply chain delivery and the experience. Yeah. And um, I'm going to post your, <clears throat> the link to your uh, blog site in the chat. Uh, still, I would ask if you guys can hold off on visiting that. So we wrap up in a few minutes. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, what I was going to also say to you is I think it's interesting how other opportunities are exposed as well. Cause like, for example, Amazon really sucks at last mile delivery. They have this whole gig economy nightmare. I mean, it, it's fine if you if if you're going to order like a you know some sponges or something, but 
like like your sleep number people that own that last mile, I think have a potential tremendous advantage against the Amazons as far as their ability to own that part of the experience, which I think is so important. And a company like Amazon right now doesn't have the bandwidth to do it. So I think it's interesting how you have dominant market leaders, but they also overlook some big opportunities. Well, owning the last mile and doing well at the last mile defines companies. But you know, I had a washer and dryer installed by Amazon and they did quite well. And I would never have thought that they would have done quite well. They actually did better than my local Lowe's and Home Depot on, you know, installing Ouch. installing equipment, right? So, you know, yell their issues, but um, I'm amazed what they've been able to do. Yeah. And uh, Josh isn't quite letting go of the CX thing. He, he agrees that CRM software is legacy, but how CX creates demand impacts supply chain. Well, it's hard not to argue that point, I guess, but. Maybe, you know, I, you know, I think it's a piece of the puzzle, Josh, and that's a discussion for another day. And I think we would be far better to look at consumption data and the translation of consumption data and customer attributes to product attributes and not just spend our time making salespeople more efficient. Indeed. Okay. Um, in a sec, I'm going to ask you a couple of things. I'm going to ask you to talk about your show in the fall because I think that's interesting. And then also want to ask you a little bit about how you sustain yourself during this time. But before we do that, I'm going to take a brief break uh, for my inter enterprise hits and misses. I always have a whiff or two every week. Uh, I actually did have a, a whiff on on Amazon, throwing a big wrench into those gurus claiming this is the year of employee experience. It's an article about Amazon forcing its warehouse workers into brutal, brutal mega cycle shifts. Uh, and, and look, I mean, I don't want to totally trash Amazon at the end of the show, but the point being that it's more that employee experience, in my opinion, is a highly overrated uh, buzzword that doesn't look at it acknowledge the realities of what we're facing right now as workers. Um, and then the other fun one was uh, was I I told LinkedIn that I. I wasn't going to congratulate a contact for starting three new positions as per their notification. I only congratulate folks who are starting a minimum of five new positions at the same time. So three <laughs> new positions was not, not enough for me. So, uh, so, so Laura, this is interesting around your show. You do a show every year. I've actually always wanted to go. Um, you're looking at a hybrid model for the fall. Tell us about that. Well, I had to cancel the event uh, this past year because of COVID and at that point in time, the virtual tools just weren't up to what I wanted to do. This year, I'm hoping that we can get the supply chain kicked into gear. And if anybody wants to read what the issues are on COVID vaccinations, I do a lot of active writing on that. But we didn't design the supply chain for effective vaccinations. But I'm hoping we solve that and that people can get their shots and we can do the show and mask and um I handpick all the speakers and we do tours and the focus is on the supply chains to admire and the companies that I think have really driven outcomes and about their journey. And it's a focus on leadership. So today I had an interview with a person from Bayer who's going to be speaking to the show on what is the tension between standardization and innovation as we think about manufacturing excellence and driving First pass yield and reliability in manufacturing. Great presentation. I have one that is on time to value for L'Oreal and you know how they're designing the supply chain so that you can scan the item at the shelf and see where everything came from and be able to get total transparency in the supply chain. We have a panel on blockchain pilots that we've been working on for the last two years and my network of networks group where we're working on authoritative identifiers and hype versus reality of blockchain. And then we also have, you know, a group that's been working on outside in processes and how we can take market signals and use pattern recognition and cognitive computing on the translation of market signals into different forms of decision support. So the event is not your yada yada typical supply chain conference. And it's not a huge conference. It's really designed for a group of 75 to 100 leaders. And it will also be virtual. And I take all of the recordings and I put them on YouTube. And I also do case studies from them. Um, so I'm hoping that it can jumpstart thinking in supply chain. 
Great. And that's coming up in September. So it's still a Correct. ways away for those of you who are trying to figure out if you'll be traveling in the fall, you have a while to figure that out. And if not, you'll be able to potentially attend virtually if you want to. So check her website for more on, on that. And by the way, if any of my regulars are noticing that I didn't flag Laura on saying the word blockchain, it's allowed when you say pilot. So uh, Laura, we have a ban on the use of the word blockchain in the mm -hmm. show. Just, just, just because of the hype factor versus reality on the ground. But if it's a pilot discussion, I think that's that's valuable and interesting because I think that's an acknowledgement that's where we're at is pilots. Well, and just to give some context, this is a two-year pilot between BSF and Avonic where two trading partners who really have great relationships have tried to work on the mapping of master data and sidechain data and the definition of a node. And I think there's an awful lot to learn here from these pilots. Yeah, and that's an interesting one too, because when we have these debates, a lot of times we say, well, blockchain is more realistic in an industry where one large supplier can dictate like what they want the other suppliers to do. But your example is valid also. If you have two suppliers that, that, that are very collaborative and want to share information, that that would work also, I think. So. Yeah, this is really around the autonomous supply chain and how do we take contracts, which we have a lot of bright lawyers that make a lot of contracts, but they're deep sixed into file cabinets. We never use them. So how do we take terms and conditions of contracts to transactions and make that stick and sticky mm -hmm. and then drive automatic payment? Dare we use the word smart contracts or would we get in trouble if we... You'd get in trouble. Smart uh, yeah, contracts get... aren't robust enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how long before we have an acronym for financial blockchain supply management? I don't know, but we're not going to coin it on this show, so we'll have to wait for another time. Uh, Laura, before we wrap up, I'm really curious, how do you keep your your spirits up during this time? Uh, it sounds Sorry. like you're being attacked at home. So let's I, do that um, first. Somebody's going to be on my front doorstep. You know, I have three dogs and I walk oh. every day and do ballet. So I think they're trying to tell me that somebody's at my doorstep. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, well, I think we reached a stopping point anyhow. So I think we're at a, a good spot for you to go check on that. But it sounds like between dogs and ballet, you have your hands full. Um, that was an outstanding discussion, Laura. Uh, thank you so much. It lived up to all my hopes and dreams. So thank you for all you do. And thanks for that authentic conversation. That was priceless. Have a great one. Thanks, everyone. I'll be back on Friday of next week. I've got some great guests lined up. Talk to you then.